Today's show is brought to you by Squarespace. Start building your website today at squarespace.com. Enter offer code UNIVERSE at checkout to get 10% off. Squarespace. Build it beautiful. And by Audible. Audible has over 180,000 audiobooks and spoken word audio products. Get a free 30-day trial at audible.com slash universe. Space is the place you go to die. It's a place of killing cold, except for the parts that are incineratingly hot. A place of crushing gravity fields, except for the parts that leave you forever adrift with no gravity at all. It's a place of stellar storms and lethal radiation and great black holes that devour anything that tips across their event horizons and into the nothingness beyond. And then there's Earth, delicate, destructible Earth, a tiny bit of watery, rocky, gaseous nothing in the infinity of space. The Earth has never made much sense in the cosmos we know. It's a fragile little world in a very rough neighborhood, one that calls for a special kind of care. Let a massive asteroid collide with Mars or Venus or our own moon, and not much will happen. They'll just shake off the impact. Not because they're bigger or stronger than Earth, but because there's not much there to break on those wasteland worlds that isn't broken already. But Earth is different. A complicated symphony of systems and subsystems, geological, biological, atmospheric, oceanic, Tweak any one of them even a little. The salinity of the oceans, the composition of the core, the temperature of the atmosphere, and the elaborate planetary machinery falls apart entirely. It's true that the Earth is only one of eight planets orbiting one of 300 billion stars in the Milky Way, which is itself just one of perhaps a hundred billion galaxies. Our expanding knowledge of the universe has always been an exercise in human humbling, with each new discovery making us seem smaller and less consequential by comparison. And yet this is true too. Of all of the worlds we've ever visited with our machines or observed with our telescopes or even trod with our boots, we've never yet seen anything remotely like Earth. There are other worlds with water, other worlds with atmospheres, other worlds that could, in theory, sustain life. But there is only one we know that actually does. That makes Earth a planet that matters a lot, not just to us, but to a universe that, until we learn otherwise, would be entirely dead without the garden of our small world. We'll continue in a moment with It's Your Universe. But first, a word from our sponsor. When it comes to building your business or brand, Getting started can feel as insurmountable as a mission to the moon. Don't let the challenge of your mission get in your way. Squarespace is your ticket for liftoff. Squarespace offers customizable designs so that you can build the best website to achieve your goals. They give you all the tools you need to build a site that looks professionally designed regardless of skill level. No coding required. Plus, you get a free domain if you sign up for a year. Start your free trial site today at squarespace.com. When you decide to sign up for Squarespace, make sure to use the offer code UNIVERSE to get 10% off your first purchase. Squarespace. Build it beautiful. Life seems to be traveling at warp speed, and taking time for hobbies feels like a rare luxury. Audible is the solution for bringing your entertainment with you, no matter how busy you are. Audible has more than 180,000 audiobooks and spoken word audio products to choose from. Take Audible with you 
when you're on the go by listening on your smartphone, computer, or tablet. Listen to books such as Splendid Solution, Jonas Salk and the Conquest of Polio, my account of one of the greatest medical triumphs of all time. In Splendid Solution, we follow Salk from his decision to develop the vaccine that will save tens of thousands of children a year from paralysis or death up to the moment his splendid invention was declared a success. Find this book or other books of all genres at audible.com. As a special offer to my listeners, you can get a free 30-day trial today by signing up at audible.com slash universe. That's audible.com slash universe. Earth has been a cosmic oddity from the beginning. It's the largest of the four rocky inner planets, but that's not saying much. With a diameter of less than 8,000 miles, it could easily fit into the hip pocket of Jupiter, which is 10 times bigger. Yet Earth is also the densest planet in the solar system, with the heavy metals in its core and elsewhere, making it a far more substantial thing than the gas giant fluff balls in the outer solar system. Jupiter has a density of just one and a third grams per cubic centimeter. Earth weighs in at five and a half grams in that same small pinch. The surface of our planet is a curious thing too. We think of it as jagged and uneven, and in some ways it is. Its deepest point is the Mariana Trench, lying 36,000 feet below the Western Pacific, or nearly seven miles underwater. Its loftiest point is Mount Everest, rising 29,000 feet, or five and a half miles, above the surrounding expanse of Nepal and China. But if you could shrink Earth down to a ball small enough to fit into your hand and shake off the thin film of water that would be its oceans, the planet would feel as smooth to the touch as a billiard ball. Earth is vastly more complicated than that, of course. Like any great machine, it's powered largely by processes that play out deep in its engine room, which in this case is its core and mantle. The innards of the Earth were long a mystery to scientists, which is one of the reasons it was so easy for us to imagine an underworld filled with all manner of beasts and other horrors. You can look up at the sky and see straight away that there aren't any monsters there. But the world beneath your feet? A mystery. In 1692, the celebrated astronomer Edmund Halley, who first calculated the orbit of the comet that now bears his name, thought he had figured things out. The Earth, he believed, was a series of nested shells, beginning with an outer layer 500 miles thick. Beneath that was a layer of nothingness, just empty subterranean space. Deeper still lay two more shells, separated by two more empty layers, at the center was a core, and what force kept all of the layers from touching, each essentially hovering inside the one that surrounded it? Gravity, Haley vaguely theorized, and went no further. The great astronomer may have been wrong about the hovering, but he was right about the layers, as scientists came to learn in the 19th century when modern seismographs were invented and made it possible to probe the Earth's stirrings and interpret what they meant. In retrospect, a layered Earth made intuitive sense. No sooner had the planet spun down out of the primal cloud of gas and dust that was the raw material for the entire solar system than the elements within the New World began sorting themselves out. The heavier materials, principally iron and nickel, sank to the center, while the successively lighter materials like silicates, basalts, and atmospheric gases stayed on top. Ultimately, the planet was left with four layers, a solid inner core, a liquid outer core, a hot flowing mantle, and a thin cool crust. The temperature of the solid core is over 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. 
that's hotter than the surface of the sun, and it ought to be more than enough to cause the core to liquefy. But the pressure at those depths, 3.6 million times greater than that of sea level air, make liquefaction impossible. In the outer core, the pressure eases off a little, and the liquid iron and nickel swirl like a pot on the boil. That, as it happens, is a very good thing. Swirling metals can behave like a dynamo. In this case, that produces a magnetic field that surrounds the planet, and that field, in turn, becomes a shield. The sun may be the source of all of the heat and light that keeps us alive, but it also emits great storms of charged particles known as the solar wind, a steady bath of radiation that would wipe out life on Earth or would have made it impossible for life to get started in the first place if it ever reached us. But the magnetic field deflects the sun's dangerous energies while leaving the skies open to its warming, life-giving ones. The Earth's internal fever drives other processes, too. The great unchanging map of the world with North America here, South America right there, Australia and Antarctica way down there, is in fact a fleeting thing. The continents float on the viscous mantle like crackers on soup, colliding, fracturing, reforming, at speeds of only a few dozen millimeters a year which is absolutely stationary on the brief scale of a human life, but pretty frantic on the much slower geological clock. All that matters for reasons that go well beyond imagining what it will be like when New York bumps into London in a few hundred million years. The biggest benefit of so dynamic a mantle is the existence of volcanoes. Volcanic eruptions billions of years ago emitted not just gas and lava, but water vapor, which, when it cooled, contributed to the formation of oceans and seas. Early in Earth's history, when the sun was only about 70% as bright as it is today, greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide in the atmosphere kept the planet warm and prevented the oceans from freezing. But as the sun brightened, the heat could have climbed too high, causing the water to boil off. Earth sidestepped that danger as the oceans and volcanic land themselves absorbed some of the atmospheric carbon, recycling it into rocks. All this was a good starting point for a young planet with hopes of becoming something great. But the new world's potential would never have been realized if it weren't for an extraordinary streak of dumb luck and fortuitous breaks that no other world in the solar system could quite match. For one thing, Earth is located in the so-called Goldilocks zone, just the right distance from the sun to allow water to remain in a liquid state. Mercury and Venus were too hot for that. Mars had a chance but its small size and its low gravity allowed the atmosphere to slip away, causing most of its water to evaporate and the little bit that remained to freeze. Earth alone remained in the comfort zone. Like the rest of the early solar system, Earth got clobbered by comets and asteroids during the epoch known as the heavy bombardment period. The comets especially carried enormous amounts of ice, which melted on impact, watering the planet further. The presence of Jupiter was one more bit of good fortune Earth enjoyed. Standing guard out beyond the orbit of Mars, it made sure the heavy bombardment period wouldn't become too heavy, thanks to its enormous gravity. Sometimes Jupiter deflected the incoming rocks, and sometimes it attracted and absorbed them, effectively taking a bullet for the sake of the smaller worlds. Earth did get hit hard once, about four and a half billion years ago, when it was smacked by a passing world roughly the size of Mars. But it spun even that near disaster into gold. The collision gave the planet its 23-degree tilt, which is responsible for its seasons, and the debris field the collision left behind eventually coalesced into the moon, 
whose light brightens the night and whose gravity pulls the tides and stabilizes the Earth's tilt, keeping its seasons rolling. If there's anything that makes Earth unique among all of the other known worlds, it's its so-called biomass, the vast community of living things that crawl upon it and fly above it, that swim in its oceans and burrow in its subsurface, that take root in its soil, and that have been growing and thriving, living and dying, for more than three and a half billion of the four and a half billion years the Earth has been around. A single creature, pick a modest one if you like, say a goldfish, contains at least as much complexity as the planet as a whole. A half ounce, two inch bit of biological nothing, the goldfish relies for its survival on its own complex universe of systems and subsystems and cells and subcells. And that's just one species among the 10 or so million believed to exist and the 1 billion or more that have ever existed. It was only 500 million years after Earth formed that stray molecules in the early oceans and seas first developed the ability to reproduce themselves. That was little more than a primordial party trick, not much different in some respects from the way crystals grow. But eventually the pre-biological molecules got better and better at reproducing, becoming larger and adding features, and eventually enclosing themselves in a cellular membrane. It was 3.6 billion years ago that a great granddaddy cell, one nicknamed Luca, for last universal common ancestor, L-U-C-A, emerged giving rise to the explosion of single-celled and multi-celled species that would one day follow. Every species that lives today, has ever lived, and ever will live, has a genealogical line that runs right back to that one cell in that ancient pond. The wildlife sanctuary that is Earth cannot endure forever. The sun, like all stars, has a finite amount of hydrogen fuel. As its gas tank slowly empties, the sun will begin to swell, turning into a red giant. In as little as a billion years, that expansion will push the Goldilocks zone further away, warming Mars and Jupiter, perhaps, but overheating Earth, which will lead to an accelerating greenhouse effect all over the planet, wiping out any organisms that can't adapt. About two million years after that, a still swelling sun will boil away most of the water on Earth. Life will hang on, some of it at least, retreating underground or into other small niches. But the refuge will be only temporary as the solar fires reach out and gobble up first Mercury, then Venus, and then Earth, which will flare and vanish like a match head. For now, though, our planet remains intact, home to biological multitudes. If all of Earth's organisms, down to the humblest single-cell creatures, are equally adapted to thrive in their particular niches, it's only one species, us, humans, who are adapted to appreciate what's around us, and the planet, over the ages, has given us much to enjoy. It may only be a trick of electromagnetism that as charged particles from the sun rush down the north and south poles of the magnetic field, they light up the sky in the luminous green curtains that are the aurora borealis. It may be just a matter of optics that when white sunlight bends through a stormy sky, it breaks open and spills out a spectrum of bright colors. It may be just serendipity that the sun is 400 times bigger than the moon, but is also 400 times further away, 
meaning that both bodies appear the same size in the sky, creating the perfect fit for the flaming sky show of a solar eclipse. If all of that is just cold science, and it is, it's warmed and redeemed by the fact that we are here to bear witness to it, and most important, to be moved by it. Earth may be small, fragile, and ultimately doomed, but it's the beachhead we've got in the ocean of space, and it's worth protecting just as it protects us. I'm Jeffrey Kluger, and this is Time Magazine's podcast, It's Your Universe, produced by Panoply.